Well, again, good morning, and whether we're joining you online or you're here today, uh, welcome. And uh, as you um, get a chance, there's a if you need a Bible, there's a Bible in front of you. If you need a Bible and you want a Bible, take a Bible, the big one that is your, a gift from us to you. If you need one, we'll, don't worry, we'll get more. Uh, and if someone could do me a favor and open up the book of Jeremiah and tell me which page number it's on. I totally forgot to, to look. Um, Jeremiah is where we're going to be heading today. And as you turn there, and just kind of keep a finger there, uh, I, one of my dear friends and former colleague I worked with, Pastor David, um, in Santa Fe, he had a tremendous skill and a hobby, uh, and it was pottery. And he made one of my treasured gifts that he gave was got a chip on it. It was this pot. And and one of the days he said, Hey Daryl, why don't you come on over? We'll talk, we'll have lunch or something. And I get there and he is actually make, making throwing clay or what do they call it? Boy, I'm gonna sound dumb. Uh, he's the clay is on the wheel, it's spinning, and he's doing the work. And I don't know if you've ever seen somebody do that. I'm sure you have at least on YouTube or somewhere. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I see someone making a pot on a wheel, it is calming. It is, is there a pad playing or something in the background? Can I hear it? Am I going crazy up here? Okay. Okay, well, as long as it lands. Um, there's, uh, it, it's calming. It's, it's relaxing, right? To, to watch somebody, the, 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 the gentleness and the smoothness and the, and the skill, and to see this lump of clay become something beautiful, something useful. Well, I, and the more I got to think about that, this is all true, unless you're the lump of clay, right? David would take this clay and he would form it and, he, and do all these things, and then he'd put a glaze on it, and then he'd put it in a kiln. And I mean, you know about kilns, that they're like, you know, 16 gazillion degrees hot. And then at a certain point, this is what makes these pots unique, and this patina and finish unique. I'm going to put this out so I don't drop it. Um, is he would throw a uh, Wall Street Journal, interestingly, newspaper in, and it would just flames, and it would create this, this new effect and patina on the glazing. And then he would inlay the copper and, and stuff around in this beautiful pattern. And again, I thought about this, and I was like, this is incredible. Here's this chunk of dirt, really, that it gets molded into something beautiful, but in the process, it has to go through to get to something useful, to get to something beautiful, and, and, and even glorious, even, if you're the lump of dirt. It's not so fun, right? <laughs> to go to be pressed, and, and molded, and, and pushed, and pulled, and stretched, and and adjusted, and then, well, let's go through the fire. But at the end, right? Mm -hmm. Something beautiful, something useful, something glorious. We find ourselves today, as we walk through uh, the different books of the Bible, and just a survey of, right now, the Old Testament, we find ourselves in the major prophets, we find ourselves in the book of Jeremiah, as I mentioned earlier. Page 751. Thank you, page 751, and we're going to look at a few different chapters kind of quickly um, to give us an overview, but if, we're, if I'm honest, particularly as I was prepping for this morning, Jeremiah is a hard book to read in a lot of, like a lot of the sections. Um, it, is a, it is a dense book, it is a, a, a long book, it's a full and rich, and there is a lot of sections of that speak of God's coming judgment, his righteous, holy, correct, fair, just judgment is coming to a rebellious and wicked people who have repeatedly, for generations, walked away from God. It is a book of even brighter hope of an eternal king who will one day restore his people, who no doubt felt forgotten by God. As we think about this, as we begin on Jeremiah, I'll give you some quick background. We'll dive into the background a little bit more next week. But Jeremiah is a prophet in Judah and Jerusalem. He's stationed primarily in Jerusalem. He's going to find himself being, being exiled into Egypt, and they're going to haul him off to Egypt, and he's going to send prophecies back while he's in Egypt, all this stuff. 
But primarily he's in Jerusalem and he's prophesizing to the nation of Judah. And you'll remember, if you look on the back of, or the front or one of them, on the handout of your thing, there is a, a, a timeline, a split, where Israel has been split into two nations, the northern tribes of Israel and the southern tribes of Judah. They've been split because of their disobedience and God is going to judge them and say, hey, you know what, things are they're not going well. And if you're the northern tribes of Israel, Assyria comes in and they conquer the, the northern tribes of Israel and they haul them off to exile. Judah lasts a little bit longer, don't they? And yet they have uh, what Jeremiah is going to speak to, along with Isaiah and others, is that there will come, <laughs> Judah, you think you're all safe. You think just because you're Israel, just because excuse me, just because you have the, the you're in Jerusalem and in, in, in the temples there, you think you're safe. But let me tell you, because of your rebellion, God will judge. So the time is when Israel and Judah are literally they're caught in the middle of a conflict between Assyria and Egypt and Babylon. Between Isaiah and Jeremiah, they're they're not quite contemporaries, but uh, you will they will see. It. The northern tribes fall to Assyria. Jeremiah will prophesy about the fall of Judah and Jerusalem to Babylon. And he will see these events come to pass. And he will see Jerusalem and the nation of Judah being hauled off into exile. I feel like every, day, every Sunday I can say it, a little happy day. <laughs> Ready? For uh, historical context, and, and a great passage is to read as you read Jeremiah, is have a Bible opened up to 2 Kings chapters 21 through 25. The events that Jeremiah is going to talk about and who he's talking to and prophesying to, that all unfolds in 2 Kings 21 through 25, okay? And we'll touch on Jeremiah the man a little bit more next week. So, again, this week I want to try this 1-2-3 approach. As we dive into a little bit, as we dip our toes in, I should say, into Jeremiah. So first, a, a one basic outline to give us a, a handle, or give us a, an outline for the book of Jeremiah. First is, the in chapter 1, the first small section is chapter 1, which acts as an introduction. You read chapter 1, you're going to get an overview of how, what the rest of the book is all about. Just a classic introduction. But then in the next major section is chapters 2 through 45, okay? How many chapters? That's like, what, 43 chapters, right? 43 chapters. Now listen to this. We'll deal primarily with prophecies of prophecies against Judah and Jerusalem. Jeremiah is a prophet of God. His message for 43 chapters is primarily to say, judgment's coming, Jerusalem. Judah, listen, you have failed. You are sinful. We are sinful. Repent because his judgment is coming. Wow. And when we read this, and you're, we're going to touch on this, it is not, there's no sugarcoating this. And then for 46 through 51, though, is interesting. This is really interesting if I think about it. Are there prophecies against the other nations? So, if, if we don't have time to get into it, but if you remember, um, God made a promise to Israel. He said, those who are against you, guess what? I'm against them. And so what's going to happen is, uh, Jeremiah is going to prophesy, listen, these evil nations, particularly Babylon, is going to be the instrument of God to bring his correction, to bring his discipline. This evil, hideous, wicked nation will be the tool used by God. Nonetheless, the second section, is made, or, excuse me, chapters 46 through 51, remind us that God does not condone the wickedness of the Babylonians or the Assyrians or the Egyptians. No, no, or any of the other nations that historically had attacked and been oppressed um, Israel. And not, in fact, he will judge them as well for their sins, just as he had, is doing for Israel. Does that make sense? He, um, and then the last section, the last chapter, really, is chapter 52, which acts as a supplement. In chapter 52, um, is a short recap. It's kind of funny. You go through this big long history, and then 52, it, it looks all the way, it looks back to to an event of Jerusalem, of Jerusalem falling to Babylon. 
And what it is is this recap of saying, hey, hey Israel, hey Judah, hey Jerusalem, hey the Jewish people. Listen, God said, you know what, you know what the first 40 some chapters prophesied that Jerusalem was going to fall and Babylon was going to fall, particularly in chapter 25? You know what? I just want you to remember that happened. And at the end of the book, he says, listen, God kept his word, and what I said was going to happen happened just as he said it would. And at the very, very end, there's this weird little story. As one commentator put it, it's this little, little, little light of hope. I said, hey, it's not, the story's not over yet. Okay? I'll let you dive into that on your own this week. So, if you would with me, turn to Jeremiah chapter 7. And we're going to, and I will admit, we are going to read some, some chunks of scripture today. And... And in doing so, my purpose in doing so is that we get the feel and the weight of what Jeremiah is being called to say to the people, okay? Jeremiah chapter 7 is considered uh, Jeremiah's temple sermon. As he's standing before the temple, he's going to speak to the people. And I guarantee you, by the end of his sermon, he was not a very popular preacher. <laughs> Read with me the uh, first 15 verses. This is what... This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house and there proclaim this message. Okay, can you picture it? He's standing in the big, you know, here's this temple, this glorious, beautiful second temple of Israel in Jerusalem, right? And he's looking down before the people who, are, who, who could very well be there to come to worship God in the temple, right? And what is the message God tells them to give? You ready? Brace yourself. Hear the word of the Lord all in all you people of Judah who come through these gates to worship the Lord, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. If you, if you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to, their, to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. You, will you steal and murder and commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known, and then come to stand before me in this house which bears my name and say, we are saved? Safe to do all these detestable things? Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. Go now to the place of Shiloh, where I first made a dwelling in my name, and see what I did, did to it because of the wickedness of my people of Israel. While you were doing all these things, declares the Lord, I spoke to you again and again, but you did not listen. I called you, but you did not answer. Therefore, what I did to Shiloh, by the way, he destroyed Shiloh for the wickedness. Just saying, that's what we need to understand. Which I did to Shiloh, I will now do to the house that bears my name, the temple you trust in, the place I gave to you and your ancestors. I will thrust you from my presence, just as I did all your fellow Israelites, the people of Ephraim. Whoa. That's a popular message. That'll preach. Really? He stands up and he says, Repent, repent, repent. Look at the evil you have done. You're following after other gods, your 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 perjury and your 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 worshiping other gods and all these you're oppressing the poor and the widow and, and all the things you're breaking my heart, God says, and I have to now discipline you. They were offering sacrifices at the temple thinking they were safe because they're in Jerusalem. But yet then on Monday they'd go off and they'd go worship their other gods and they'd do some other things and they'd go, you know, oppress the poor and steal from the this and they would, right? This sounds a little bit familiar like last week. Right? This, Isaiah was like, hey, stop coming to the, to the temple to, to worship, God says. Well, you, I don't care about your sacrifices. I want your obedience. I want you to trust me and to follow me. Don't Come to think, like, just because I gave a good sacrifice, I can do whatever I want. Don't, that's mocking God. God's like, I will not be mocked. But look at the result. Jump down to verse 27 of chapter 7, 27 to 29. 
He says, when you tell them all of this, God says to Jeremiah, they will not listen to you. When you call to them, they will not answer. Therefore say to them, this is the nation, this is the nation that has not obeyed the Lord, its God, or responded to correction. Truth has perished, it has vanished from their lips. Now, as a pastor, I, I want to believe that if, if, if I, or as, 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 as a congregant, as a, a member, I want to believe that if a pastor or a friend or, or, or a colleague or someone who comes to me and shows me from God's Word the, the, my, my wickedness and my evilness and things that I need to change, I want to believe that. I'll be like, hey, you know what? You're right. I'm sorry. I repent. Jeremiah, in this powerful message, stands before the people and he proclaims and, and calls them on their, <laughs> their guilt. And what is their response? Yeah, whatever. What are you talking about? We're good. I'm good. He says, they will ignore you. The people of Judah rejected Jeremiah. They ignored him. And in fact, if you, when you read through this book, you will see Jeremiah's message over and over and over and over and over again being rejected and ignored by the people. This is his life. It's hard messages, rejected, ignored, even persecuted. Yeah, by the way, as you read Jeremiah, as I encourage you to do this week, I want you to take note of something. In spite of the hardships, in spite of the rejection, in spite of the hard message he has to give, Jeremiah is faithful, isn't he? He's faithful to the message God tells him to give. Because God told him, this is what I want you to say. Stand up before these people. And yet, what did he say? Did he say, ah, that's a little harsh, God. No, he said exactly what God said. And I want to give a word of warning here about chapter 7. Do not hide behind the unfamiliarity or the difference of Israel's sins versus our own. Because my question is, what would God have Isaiah say to you? <coughs> What would God have Isaiah call me out on? Oh, I may not be worshiping Baal off in the, into the fields or something, and I haven't killed anyone, but I got other sins that Isaiah could say, God could say, hey, Isaiah, you know what I want to call? You know what? I need you to talk to Daryl, and I need you to tell him, I see what you're doing. <laughs> I know what your heart is. We got some stuff we got to deal with. Right? Don't let the unfamiliarity or the, the cultural difference between the sins of Israel and the temple in our lives today, let's not hide behind that. Let's be honest before, before what God's Word says we are to be and to be like and to do and to act and to say and to think and allow God to say, hey, you know what? we got to take care of that. Now turn to chapter 18. Chapter 18. Chapter 18, this is where I get my introduction from. Chapter 18, uh, verses 1 through 12. Here we find that God, and God has every right, every full right, to fully rule and judge our lives. 18, verse 1 through 12. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. Okay, so where is he at? He's at a potter's house, you can picture it. So maybe the guy was like... Molding and working some clay, right? So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as, he seemed, best, as, it, as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me and said, Can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord? Like the clay in his hand of the, of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warn repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on, in, inflict, excuse me, inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended to, to do for it. 
Now therefore say to the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says, Look, I am preparing a disaster for you and devising a plan against you. So turn from your evil ways, each one of you, and reform your ways, your actions. But what is their reply? It's no use. We will, we will continue with our own plans and we will all follow the stubbornness of our evil So here's the picture, object lesson time, right? This is a beautiful object lesson. It's a, well, maybe, maybe not so beautiful. It is, a, it is a profound and vivid object lesson. Chunk of clay spinning on the wheel, hands pressed into it, and then it's like, hey, it's getting wonky. So what does the potter do? It makes it into another pot. Now, if you're the chunk of clay, how does that feel? Not fun. But what is the point of this? The point is, Jeremiah, God's saying to Jeremiah, look, I'm God. If I choose to, 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 to tear down, if I've chosen, like, listen, I'm going to tear you down, but you relent and you repent, I can build you right back up. And if I choose, if I plan to say, hey, listen, I'm going to build you up, and yet you choose to disobey me, I have every right to press in harder, to reshape, to refold, to move in. And I'm going to use judgment in, in hard times and discipline to accomplish my good and perfect will for you. God has every right. And their response, by the way, <laughs> I said it cuts to the quick, but their response was... Israel's response was Jerusalem's response. Oh, thank you, Jeremiah. Oh, we need all oh, we forgot. You're right. God, you, you are right. You are God. We are not. Oh, man, we are guilty. We are sinful. You have every right to, to, to break us down. But God, we call upon your mercy. We call upon you to relent from, as you say your word, you would. Is that their response? No. No, we're going to keep doing what we're doing because it's going so well. Might be some warning in there. Look. No. No. Look at verse 18. Jump down to verse 18. So, they said, come. Now get this. All this. And this is their response. Come. Let's make plans against Jeremiah. For the teaching of law by the priest will not cease. This guy won't shut up. Nor will counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophets. So come, let's attack him with our tongues and pay no attention to anything he says. Oh, that Jeremiah, ah, false prophet. Don't listen. He's just wah, 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 wah. Debbie Downer saying all this bad stuff's going to happen. Let's, we're, things are good. We're good. Look at all the fun we're having. We're rich. We're prosperous. We're secure because we're in Jerusalem. Oh. Scary, right? Here's the first takeaway. First takeaway, and that's the third part of the handout. God does have full reign and rule over his people, does he not? God does have full rule and reign as king of us over us, you and me. The question is, how do we respond to God's promptings, God's discipline, God's word, when it calls us out? Do we think because things are going well in our lives that we're okay? That we've got everything figured out? That there's nothing in our lives that we need to change according to God's Word? Are we resistant when, when maybe when maybe you're in Sunday school class and, 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 and we get a little convicted like, hey, maybe I shouldn't be doing this or this or maybe that. Maybe I need to rethink. Maybe I need to go apologize. Maybe I reacted too poorly in this situation. Ah, it's not that big a deal. I think it is. So, now, turn to, uh, look at, and then jump down to chapter 19, by the way. 19, so here's the result, by the way. He gives this prophecy. The result, their response is, ignore him. In fact, not just ignore him, let's persecute him. Let's discredit him. And then look at verse 19. This is what the Lord says, go and buy a clay jar from a potter. Another object lesson. If you didn't get the first one, let me help you out, God says. <laughs> Go and buy a clay jar from a potter. Take 
along some of the elders of the people and the priests, and go out to the valley of Ben-Hanan, near the entrance of the, uh, the gate. There, proclaim the words I tell you, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, the King of Judah, and the people of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Listen, I am going to bring disaster on this place that will make the ears of everyone who hears of it tingle, for they have, for, for they have forsaken me and made this place of foreign gods. They have burned the incense. In, in it to gods that neither they nor their ancestors nor the kings of Judah ever knew. And they have filled this place with the blood of the innocent. They have built the high places of Baal to burn their children and in the fire as offerings to Baal. Did you catch this, by the way? What is Judah guilty of? All the other ones are like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, okay. We, no, what are they guilty of? When they're worshiping the false gods of Baal, the evil is so entrenched that they're actually practicing child sacrifice just like the pagans. Right? <laughs> Something I did not command or mention, nor did it enter my mind, God says. So beware the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer call this place Topeth, the Valley of ben Hinnom, but the Valley of Slaughter. Now, jump down to verse 18. Excuse me, sorry, look at verse 10. Verse 10. Then, Jeremiah, this is what I want you to do. I want you to break the jar while those who go with you are watching. And say to them, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I will smash this nation and this city just as this potter's jar is smashed and cannot be repaired. They will bury the dead in Topheth until there is no more room. Now, I have to say, I went all over my house, and I've got lots of pots, and I've got lots of plants, and I went all over, and I'm last thing, i got lots of the, um, like clay terracotta pots. i got lots of them. I can see them all over. And then I went to grab one, and like all of them are plastic. They just look like they are. <laughs> I had one big one, and to be honest, I didn't feel like repotting it, because what I wanted to do, and I wasn't going to do with this one, obviously, is I was going to set a clay pot here, and I was going to take a sledgehammer, Because that's what Jeremy, can you, first off, we need to pause for a minute. Do you see God's graciousness, his mercy that he is trying to show over and over and over? How else could God have tried to warn these people? Straight communication, word, judgment's coming unless you repent. You're not getting it. You ain't picking up what I'm laying down. So what am I going to do? I'm going to give you an object lesson. Let's go to the potter's house. And look, see this? I can do what I want. I want to relent. Nope, ignore that. Now, okay, take the clay pot that has been formed. I will smash it. Why? Because of your guilt. But. Turn to chapter 29. Please. Turn to 29. Turn to chapter 29. As you turn to chapter 29, a quick background. Chapter 25, uh, particularly 8 through 12, Jeremiah had prophesied that the exile, that one Babylon would come in. The, the nation of Babylon would come in and they would actually defeat Assyria, which they, they absolutely did. And Babylon was going to be the one that, that would defeat and lay siege to and defeat and Jerusalem, and haul them off to exile. And in chapter 25, Jeremiah, God says, listen, I'm going to tell you exactly, the exile, you'll be hauled off for 70 years. Okay, so that's the prophecy background. And interestingly, if you look back into Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 30, Deuteronomy 30, um, <laughs> centuries and centuries and centuries before God said, this is exactly what will happen if you choose to disobey and rebel against me. And lo and behold, it is happening centuries later. But what you need to know in chapter, leading up to chapter 29, there's false prophets who are saying, oh, this exile, it's not, gonna, it's not a long, it's going to be a short time. Don't you worry. A couple years, we'll be back in the homeland, no big deal. In fact, you know what? In a couple years, God says that, that we're going to get all our gold back and all our plunder back. And we're going to do everything. So it's just, just a couple years, we're good. But what did God say in chapter 25? 70 years. 
So chapter 29 is Jeremiah's correction, or God's correction through Jeremiah of these false prophets. So read with me 1 through 9. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets of all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into, into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jehoiakim and the queen mother, the court officials and leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, skilled laborers and the artisans had gone into exile from Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter to Elash, son of Sephram, and so forth. Look at verse 1. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now listen to this. This is interesting. He's talking to people. This is the message for people who have been hauled off from their homeland to exile into a foreign pagan land. And what is God's instruction to them? It's only going to be a couple times? It's only going to be a couple years? You'll be back home, just relax, hang tight, we're there. What does he say? No, no, he says something very different. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you, and in my name I have not sent them, declares the Lord. So, now this is interesting. If you're in exile, what would your response be? Paul, if, if you're in Jerusalem, and then lo and behold, Nebuchadnezzar comes in and hauls you and your off, separates you from your family, separates you from whatever, what's your response? What, what, I think my response would not be, Hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to build a house here. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to start a life here. Right? But that's exactly what God says. Because what is God going to do in these 70 years? This is off my notes. What did God do when Israel was in slavery to Egypt? He built them up. They grew. Right? He continued his work in the nation with the people for it, right? What is God going to do in the 70 years? He says, I don't want you to decrease. I don't want you to say, oh, it's over, it's done, I'm, that's it, I'm out, forget it. No, he says, no, 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 no. Obey me, live your life, thrive. And here's the kicker above it all. You know those people that hauled you off into exile, that ripped you from your family, that took your land, that took your money, took everything? You know what I want you to do? I want you to work for their good. I want you to pray that they are prosperous. I want you to live in peace. Well, this is just getting crazy. But this is what he says. Build homes and gardens, marry, increase. Practically speaking, what's that phrase? Uh, rising tide raises all boats. Right? This is it. If they prosper, you prosper. Second takeaway, real quick. Do good, even when it's hard. Do good, even when you don't want to. Do good, when life has fallen apart. Trust God and thrive in what He's called you to do, because you get what is implied in here, by the way, is God is still with His people in exile. Why? Why, why, why? Look at verse 10 through 14. Jeremiah 10 through 14. Why? Because when we live and we thrive and we do good and we trust God, even when it's hard, this is what the Lord says in verse 10. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you what? Back to this place. Verse 11, here we go. I'm going to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, Judah, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, Judah, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And then, and then you will call on me and come and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. 
You will seek me, and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and you will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Do you see the hope? <laughs> I mean, they're hauled off in exile, and things are going to get even worse following this. But Jeremiah says, listen, God said, listen, it's going to get bad, but listen, 70 years, guess what's going to happen? How can I thrive now? How can the, can the Judah and the exiles thrive and plant vineyards and, and gardens and marry and have families? How? Because they know the 70 years is going to end. The pressing and the molding and the fire and the judgment will end 70 years from now. God says, I will bring you back. By the way, to cut to the quick, what happens 70 years later? <laughs> oh yeah, they get to come back. Because Babylon wasn't God. And God just brought somebody else in to take care of Babylon. To allow his people to come back. 70 years will end. Our hardships, even the discipline from God, will end. Last week we talked about the purpose of God's judgment, by the way, God's discipline, is not to destroy, is it? But to purify, to change us, to break away that junk in our lives that hinders us from following Him, experiencing the full life and the full joy of being in fellowship with Him. But then look at, and then if you turn the pages, like one more page, Chapters 30 through 33 is this glorious section in the book of Jeremiah. It's called the Book of Consolation. In the middle of all these prophecies of judgment against Judah and Jerusalem, smack in the middle, right there, right in the heart of it all, is this whole three, four chapters of consolation that are just jam-packed full of hope which is obviously much needed, no doubt. It speaks of a future Messiah. Look at uh, chapter 30, verses 3. One little verse. It says, um, this is what the Lord says, God, write it in the book. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will bring my people, Israel and Judah, back from captivity and restore them to the land I gave their ancestors to possess. Jumping down to 8, verse through 11, it says, In that day, speaking of this future day, that God will declare the Lord Almighty, I will break the yoke off their necks and I will tear off their bonds. No longer will foreigners enslave them. Instead, they will serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Speaking of this future king of David's line. So do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant. Do not be dismayed, Israel, declares the Lord. I will surely save you out of a distant place and your descendants from the land of their exile. Jacob will again have peace and security and no one no one, no one, no one will make him afraid. I am with you, and I will save you, declares the Lord. Whoa. Look at verses 12 through 13. We'll just keep reading as I'm reading. Sorry. Though I, though I completely destroy all the nations among which I scatter you, I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you, but only in due measure. I will not let you go entirely unpunished. Now look at verse 12. This is what the Lord said. Your wound is what? Incurable. Your injury beyond what? No doubt that Israel felt, Judah felt this way. They have been crushed. They're hauled off in exile. You can't return from this. Everything is gone. And God says, your wound is incurable. Your injury is beyond healing. And look at verse 17. Jump down. This is where it gets fun. But God says, I will what? Restore you to help. Verse 17. But I will restore you to help and heal your what? So with God, the incurable wounds and the things that can't be fixed, guess what? With God, they what? Can be. It may look like nothing good can come up of this. It may look like it's beyond hope, but with God, all things are possible, even the incurable wounds and heal can heal, right? Third takeaway, God is not done. He's not done with Israel. He's not done with you. And that is really good news because this is the gospel, isn't it? That we, are just as Israel, just as Jerusalem, just our sins may be different, but we stand just as guilty against the holy God, don't we? We fully deserve His righteous judgment of wrath. There's a, there's a, 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 a chapter in 
Jeremiah, and why I can't remember it, and right now I forget. It speaks of the, the picture that God uses is that um, the, the cup of God's wrath is filled to the brim, and it's just going to pour over. And it's going to pour out onto Israel, but it's going to be the, by the, that wrath is going to come from the nation of, by the nation of Babylon. And it's just going to pour, and Israel must drink of his wrath. The picture is what does Jesus say when he's in the garden? God, take this what from me? This cup from me, because he knows that in drinking that cup, he's going to drink the wrath of God that you and I deserve. And he's, he takes it. And all of Jer Jeremiah in chapters 30 and 31, 32 and 33, they all are just pointing to this future Messiah, this future guy named Jesus who is going to come to restore his people. And how is he going to do it? He's going to do it by drinking the cup of wrath that we deserve on our behalf. So that our incurable sins, the wound, the, in, the, the, the wound of sin that will not and cannot heal because it is just against a holy and infinite and perfect God, can be healed because God himself came and drank that cup and only he can be the satisfaction the, satisfi the satisfying substitute on our behalf does that make sense? God is not done because he drank from the cup on our behalf we don't have to we can be restored, we can be forgiven we can be healed, we can be granted eternal life both now and forever, God is not done. You and I are not too damaged. Christ, the promised Savior, has come, has died, has risen, and invites you and I to trust Him, to allow Him to mold us, to allow Him to press into us, maybe to start things over at times. Well, that's not fun. But what is God doing? What was He doing for Israel and Jerusalem and Judah? He was saving them, wasn't He? Was he doing it for you for you and I? He's saving us, isn't he? Because we allow him to put the pieces of our lives back together. He doesn't just put them back together. <laughs> Get this. He creates something entirely new. Something glorious. Something good. Something really, really good. And that's really good news, isn't it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah is a, at times, difficult book to read. But in the midst of it, all I can say is when I look at these sections that speak of your unfailing love, of your unfailing and all of your mighty hand and your ever, your desire, your, your ever so present desire to save, to relent from wrath, all I can say is thank you. Thank you that when I read Jeremiah, I see your son. I see you promising over and over and over and over again that you would send a Savior. And we now know by reading the New Testament that that Savior is your son, Jesus. We read in Hebrews chapter 8 and 9 that Jesus is the fulfillment of all things that Jeremiah prophesied. And all we can say is thank you. God, may we heed to your instruction and turn to you. May we trust you, listen to your word. May we, we repent of our sins and seek your forgiveness. May we seek peace and prosperity of this city. May we do good and obey you even when it's hard. And God, thank you for not giving up on us. Thank you for pushing on us and molding us, for sending your Son to die for us so that we may know you and have life, life eternally with you. In Jesus' name.